Linux got it right right off the bat. Let's talk about Clicker. So the next homework is out. We're only going to have one homework assignment for learning objective five. So no choices this time. Everybody's going to go through Clicker. So let's talk about Clicker, uh, which is kind of, uh, which has some advantages. On Friday's lecture, I can talk about Clicker specifically. I usually can't talk about a specific assignment since there's more than one of them out there. Uh, so let's talk about Clicker a little bit. In see ya. All right, I'm gonna add her right now. Try to not spell your name incorrectly again because I've done it before. Um, so Clicker is a Clicker game. For those of you familiar with Clicker games, you you'll have an idea of what this is. For those of you not familiar, I'll apologize in advance if I get you addicted to Clicker games. If you end up exploring these to see what they are. Uh, the uh, kind of quintessential one is Cookie Clicker. If you've uh, if you've had my 199 module, you've seen this before. But Cookie Clicker, we have a cookie, and you click it, and that's uh, on the surface. That's about it. Every time you click the cookie, you get one cookie, and you can eventually purchase equipment at least what I call in the assignment equipment that will increase how many cookies you get each click and also give you idle income as time passes so these are the features we, we apparently we have to wait 10 seconds for that and uh, idle income as five seconds passes I'm going to automatically collect one cookie so these are the features that we want is being able to click purchase equipment that will make our clicks more effective and also give us idle income as time passes. These are the features we want. So let's build these. I'm a, addicted already, Mr. Muffin. Yeah, it's... Uh, if you like watching numbers go up, which I do, for sure, these games are surprisingly addicting. Even when it's a very bare bone structure, they can be really addicting. Uh, the one that you built, you know... If you have that functionality, you'll understand all of the code. So, if you uh, if you have that method, uh, it won't be the same one as Cookie Clicker, though. We will have server verification on this, uh, but you can have click bots and things like that. You can do click bots on this one. So, for this, uh, we're going to have multiple pieces of equipment, types of equipment that can be purchased, and also different types of currency that we can click. For example. Cookie clicker, the currency would be cookies. Um, for ours, it could be anything depending on a configuration file. So for example, if you want the currency to be gold and you want three different types of equipment, shovels, excavators, and mines, we'll specify that with a configuration JSON string and you'll parse through some JSON. So we're getting JSON back in our lives in a big way. Parse through this JSON string to figure out what the configuration is like, how many, how powerful each piece of equipment is, how much they cost, and also how their price increases as you purchase these things. All these games have an exponential increase in the price of the equipment or buildings usually referred to of the games. So we're specifying that exponent um, to build the game. Your code will get this string and build the game based on that. And then combine actors and a WebSocket server to implement the game itself. So actually, I do want to. I should have set this up before lecture in hindsight, but uh, if I can do this quickly, we'll drive. I'll just try this very quickly. Hopefully I can get this without too much hassle. I'm not 100% sure this will work, but. No, I did the wrong file. Uh, but I'll give this at least a few seconds. And sorry, you can't even see what I'm doing right now. I don't have it on the right screen, but I'll do this quick enough. 
that we should that one's on screen right yeah it's I should just set this up on this machine Mm, I can fix that. I can fix that. Why don't I have that? Oh no, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have gone down this rabbit hole, but I'm so close. Try this. But now I want to see it to the end. Copy. Sorry to keep everybody waiting. Shit. All right. Never mind. I'm calling it. It's not it's not gonna happen. Uh I should have had that set up before uh, beforehand. So uh we're not gonna see the, the working product. I have it running on my laptop, I never transferred it over to the desktop. I'm trying to do it quickly, but no, I'm I I am i will do it during Q and A if uh if that's what y'all wanna see. So uh so it's going to be combined actors and a WebSocket server. We're going to have an actor which is going to control the a, in, an instance of the game itself. Chat with the save. We're doing it. <laughs> oh no. Is this gonna work? So there it is. We're doing this. High tech stream right here. So here's the GUI. Once you enter your username, if you have a server up and running, you'll see the game like this. And I can click, in my case, for my configuration that I use is compiling code. And if I click compile code, oh, it's hard to hold this steady when I can't really see. I get code compiling. Once I get enough code compiling, I can start buying equipment, which will make my code compilation even more effective as I do more and more testing in this case. So that's the game. That's what you'll see once you get your server up and running. And uh, this really high tech way of showing you that. Uh, once you get your server up and running, that's what the, the game's going to look like. So this works in two parts. The game actor itself, which is uh, which is controlling an instance of the game as an actor. So you can have multiple games running at the same time. Our ultimate goal here is to have this hosted on a web server where multiple users can be playing their own instance of the game simultaneously. So we're going to build a game actor where each user has one instance of this actor running in the actor system. And then each user has a separate actor controlling their inputs. This actor is going to be able to get uh, two types of information from the users. They clicks and purchasing, attempting to purchase equipment. Uh, and also updates to get the idle income. And then on the web server side, on the WebSocket server side, uh, this is going to control... Uh, the kind of bridge the gap between the web sockets and the actors. So when somebody sends a message over the web socket that, hey, I just clicked the, the button here, 
that message is going to be relayed to the appropriate actor. And then, um, and this will also control actors sending the state of the game back to the user. The web, the WebSocket server is going to be the kind of the glue between all of that, the users themselves and the actors that are running that user's game. And the big job for the clicker server is keeping track of that information, that you'll have a WebSocket connection and an actor reference, and you need to remember that those two are linked, that that user for that WebSocket connection is related to that actor reference. So when messages come from either one of those, you know where to forward those messages to. That's a lot of the job of the WebSocket server. Uh, and there is an expansion objective, build autosave. So as you're playing the, the game, uh, when you stop playing for a while, apparently I had half a thought there, uh, as you're playing a clicker game, you don't want to lose your progress really ever. Uh, when playing a clicker game, you might play this game over the course of um, several weeks or months even. You don't want to lose your progress when you close the browser, and you also don't want to lose your progress if the server has to restart. So what we want to do for this expansion is implement an autosave where a no action from the user, no action on the user's part, if somebody comes back with the same username that was already started the game, that they'll resume their game right where they left off and also earn any idle income that they should have earned both when they were offline and even when the server is shut down. So you still need to... Uh, calculate that idle income even when the server is not running so uh, so you don't lose any uh, any income you don't come back to your game after not playing for a few days and still be at the the same currency that you were at when you left uh, that's not what we would want from a clicker game <laughs> this is the production quality your tuition is paying for yeah if I I don't even get reimbursed for the streaming equipment I had to buy. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could use some of your tuition money to uh, to build my setup here. Uh, looking like we are using queues and linked lists for this project. Um, maybe that's uh, that's where you want to take it um, for the database. So uh, so no database required. A Till the autosave, but even autosave, I am allowing file IO because we haven't even talked about databases yet. Uh, so this is Clicker, and there there are other ideas. I almost uh, had a different expansion objective to have a prestige system. If you played Clicker games and idle games, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I'd like to to point out or or make this um, make this explicit at least. For your open-ended objective for the proposal, uh, reminder proposals due Sunday if you want to do an open-ended objective. Uh, for an open-ended objective, you can propose a, another expansion of your own design of a homework. So if you want to build a prestige system for this game or add other features to this thing um, and also get an application objective for it beyond the autosave, you can do effectively two expansion objectives for this assignment and uh, uh, and get your two application objectives for the expansion and the open-ended. Same with any other assignment. If there's an assignment without an expansion objective that you really enjoyed, pitch it through an open-ended objective and then uh, and work on it that way. All right, with all that, let's get into some slides. WebSocket clients. So we've seen the server side of WebSockets, but we haven't interacted. We haven't seen the other side of that to actually have some interaction between these. And what's, what are the tiers for? Tardy Puritus?
I, yeah, I missed something. Did, unless you heard my daughter in the background. Uh, so uh, let's talk about WebSocket clients and see the other side of this connection. So for this, uh, can I do two different expansions for a calculator? Then? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Uh, for any assignment. So the open-ended, it's it meant to be as open-ended as possible. Anything you want to do, pitch it as an open-ended objective. Uh, if that means expanding a homework even further, go for it. Do it. Uh, so for the lecture question today, it's similar to... Uh, similar to Monday's lecture question, uh, and it, strictly speaking, only requires Monday's lecture content. You can do this with lecture Monday's lecture content, uh, but to test this, which testing won't be required for WebSocket servers, the testing is pretty tricky. Even for the clicker homework, uh, the testing, even the testing objective, which of course isn't graded in Autolab, just like the last few assignments, uh, even that... Um, I don't really expect unit testing or behavioral testing uh, with these. So no testing required, but to test it on your own side, you would write a client and uh, and test the functionality through that client where you didn't really need a client for the Monday's lecture question. Um, you kind of kind of could kind of, I don't know. I, I feel like this sentence isn't going anywhere. <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, uh, and I did make the deadline for Monday's lecture question um, on Autolab as tomorrow to reflect that, that you kind of do need a client to, to test that one too. I did provide one in the repo, but I forgot to mention it, so it doesn't really help. But anyway, build an echo server, a, a WebSocket server that's going to listen for connections on localhost 8080. And when it receives a message of type send back with some string, it's going to echo that string back to the sender. So it's going to send back to the person who sent it that message, a message of type echo containing the same contents of that send back message that it received. So uh, so we're interacting with the client. That's the one thing that we didn't have on Monday's lecture question is actually sending information to the client, uh, to a client. So let's see how to do this, how to build some clients to actually interact with our servers. So just building servers, as it turns out, isn't very interesting unless you have clients connected to them. So we built the server. Let's build clients to connect to that server and communicate with that server. So a reminder of our architecture that we're ultimately building, that we'll get the, the database next week. Uh, over the next few weeks, we'll talk about the entire structure and how to build apps that have this whole, um, this whole infrastructure. So we talked about actor systems. We know how to get actors uh, created in a system communicating with each other by passing messages and uh, in the form of case objects and case classes. We we saw a WebSocket server, which is listening for messages over a WebSocket, where the message types are always strings, and they can either have no information attached to them, which would be like a case object, or they can have string information attached to them, like a case class with one constructor parameter of type string. Those are the two types of messages we could receive. And then the string for the actual type of message, I know I just said there's only two, but uh, either a, a string content or no content. And the type, based on that string of the type, we would defer that to a different listener to be able to uh, handle that message when a message of that type arrives. Now we want to talk about the front ends. We'll talk about the web and desktop front end today. Uh, and let's go through these one at a time. Most of today's lecture is pulling in libraries and seeing the new syntax for those libraries to do the things that we've seen before. So the concepts here should look familiar, and we, we have this one more opportunity to hammer down those concepts. Uh, and the, the syntax is what will, a lot of what we'll end up talking about. And I gotta, I realize these slides, should have moved all these over, but I didn't, uh, didn't think I'd, need to actually I don't need to um, so let's set this up to have a web client connect to our Scala WebSocket server like which is what we just saw in the on my laptop is having a web front end connecting to a Scala WebSocket server so first we need some HTML it's a web page so we better have some HTML out there and this is going to control HTML uh, stuff just the structure of the page mostly um, 
and all the imports that we need. We could style this, uh, but you know, if you want to style yours, uh, of course, for your clicker assignment, I'm not grading the front end at all that I provided. So if you want to add style to your clicker game and change the layout, uh, like the clicker game that you saw, it's just an HTML table with a bunch of uh, data thrown on it. It's nothing too, uh, too crazy. If you want to style that up, by all means, have fun. Uh, have a blast with it. Uh, so first, we need to download the uh, the uh, the library. Oh man, what am I thinking of? The uh, we have to download the library, which is a bit different in front end. Uh, no, you've seen this. Uh, you've seen this in one fifteen. I'm explaining stuff we don't need to talk about. Uh, but we need to download that library just like you did in one fifteen. Uh, which is going to be the Socket.io library. We put that in the head of our HTML, and that library is going to be downloaded when uh, when we load this page in the browser. The browser is going to see that we have this library that needs to be downloaded. It's going to go to this website, download that library, and now we have access to that library in our JavaScript code. Then set up some structure. I just have... Uh, uh, I, I left the ID as gold, apparently. Uh, just some chat, uh, basic chat functionality. I want to be able to type in a message and then submit that message. The ID should not be gold here. Uh, and then an empty div where I'm going to uh, display the messages that, uh, that the server sends to me. So uh, a very basic setup. You've seen similar things at least in 1.15. Um, just setting up some HTML structure. Then we want to download our JavaScript. We're going to have a file called webclient.js, which among other things is going to define the send message method, or send method function, send, send message function. We're going to define that in this webclient.js. So when we call this function, it's going to call the definition that we have in this file. So let's take a look at that file and see what we're going to do. Well, you look at that for a second while I catch up on until chat here. Are we going to host? Are you going to host your server on Cloudflare? Um, all right, I'm not stopping you. Uh, go for it. So this is something that over the next two weeks I want to emphasize a lot. So this will be the first time that I, I mention this, um, that the apps we're building are completely ready to be deployed on the internet. They're, uh, they have what they need. We have a WebSocket server that's listening for connections. When we're testing, those connections are just on our machines. We're just connecting to localhost. We're just opening the HTML file. But the technologies we're using work just the same if you have somebody across the world connecting to your WebSocket server. Uh, through the internet. And when you build your clicker game, if you deploy that, if you host that on a server, you can have people from all around the world connecting to your server, getting actors created for them. Like all the technology that we're using is all ready to be a full web app. Everything's there. Uh, and over the next two weeks, once we're done with the learning objectives, that's uh, going to be one of my biggest focuses is how does all everything we learn in this course come together to build these apps that people can use uh, so yeah take your code go to play it let people play it i'll put it on congregate let people play it there uh, and uh so in our javascript we're going to connect to our server this is the the big line that's going to make that connection between the client and the server we'll specify our host and port we're running on localhost and uh, port 8080. As long as this matches our server, we're going to get that connection to the server. And we're specifying, this is something uh, kind of annoying with the library. We have to specify to use WebSockets, even though it's a WebSocket library. This, uh, this code will switch to long pulling in certain cases. I don't know exactly what cases those are, but I've had a, I had a really annoying bug where it defaulted to long pulling and um, and didn't give me my WebSocket functionality. So I always use this, specify, hey, 
WebSocket library, use WebSockets. But um, I don't know, it seems silly, but I like to have it there so I don't run into that bug again because I lost many hours of my life uh, chasing that one down. And then finally on to the good bits. So here, when uh, we want to specify two things, what to do when we receive a message of a, of a particular type. And these types, whenever we're using this Socket.io library, the types are going to be the same as the types that we saw on the WebSocket server side. We're going to have a string representing the type of message. And then that message can have a string uh, of data attached to it, or it might not have any data attached to it. So when we receive a message of those type, of a particular type, we're going to use this socket.on, socket being my variable name, but whatever your connection, whatever your variable you store that in, dot on, use the on method and specify two things, the message type that you expect to receive from the server and a callback function that's going to be called whenever a message of that type is received. So whenever a message of type ACK is received from the server, we're going to call, or JavaScript rather, is going to call this function with the data attached to that message. So if we receive a message, if the server sends a message of type ACT using, using send event, sends a message of type ACK with some string of data, that string of data is going to be in this event variable or whatever you name this variable, I named it event. Uh, this function is going to be called with that data whenever we receive a message of that type. And then I'm going to take that data from that message and just display it on the website, modify some inner, uh, inner HTML, and display that to the user. I have another message type of type stopped, uh, server stopped. This is the message that the server uh, from Monday's lecture is sending whenever it stops. This is similar to a case object in that it doesn't have any data. So event here is going to be undefined we can still have this variable name in the function just uh, because JavaScript allows that, um, but this will be undefined. So we can't access event here because there's no information in it, but we don't expect to. That's part of our design is that we don't expect any information to be there. We just receive a message of type stop server stopped. And that's all we need to know is that an event occurred, which was the server sending us a message of type server stopped. That's all we need to know. And we're going to display that to the user. The server has stopped. All right. Nope. I was supposed to do that click a while ago. So ACK was like a case class in that we had some information attached to the message. And then server stopped was similar to a case object in that we just care that we received a message of that type. We don't have any information attached to that that we need to deal with. What does emit do? We're getting there. Hold on, blah, blah. Emit, the emit method, uh, is when we want to send messages to the client. So we connected to the, or to the server. We connected to the server and we said, here's what we do when we receive messages from the server. That's what we use on for. When we want to talk to the server, we want to send a message to the server. That's when we're going to use the emit method. So emit is going to use very similar syntax to uh, to send event from the server and that we're going to specify either uh, we're going to specify a string which is going to be the message type that we're sending so we're sending a message of type chat message to the server and this message has some information attached to it so I'm going to use a second parameter which is a string that I want to send to the server so this is similar to a case object I'm sending a message of type chat message with the information that I expect attached to it. So on the server this is where we would have a an event listener listening for events of type string. And we're going to call that event listener. We're going to use that event listener when we receive messages of type chat message. So on the server, we have add event listener, chat message, new event listener listening for types of, of type string, uh, information of type string. And then I have that event listener uh, implemented to receive that string and then process that information however it needs to be processed. So those are our two sides. What do we do when we get messages of particular types and how do we send messages of particular types?
really that's all we need. Everything else is JavaScript, writing your JavaScript to do whatever you want to do. And these are the interactions with the client on and emit. Those are your two ways of interacting with the server using WebSockets. Oh, that really was my last slide on it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the syntax. That's the structure. It's still message types. And some messages contain extra information that's being communicated. And we handle events differently based on the type of the message being sent or received. Let's talk about desktop front ends. This is something we haven't talked about a lot. I'm saving it for the next two weeks. Uh, I have them on the schedule as next Wednesday and Friday, but I have to do some restructuring there. I have to fit in a, at least one lecture on Git. Uh, so I'll be moving those, but at some point over the next two weeks, we'll talk about desktop GUIs. Uh, this semester, I've just been providing them for you in each homework assignment. Uh, but let's talk about these, either a web front end or a desktop front end. So let's talk about specifically the, sock, the WebSocket IO part, and then we'll get the rest of the GUI part over the next two weeks. So for this, we're going to pull in another library. The, the type for emit was uh, 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 what was it? a string, but that string can be formatted. If we need to send more complex information, we'll send a JSON string so we can communicate a lot of information. I'm, yeah, how did that, it was just at 40. How did it just dip to 24? Uh, now there's, I'm going to, I'm going to call that a bug in the viewer counter. I think we have, uh, I think we have more viewers than that, but, uh, at least I hope so. I hope, uh, um, people are paying attention, but, uh, uh, so we're going to pull in another library for this. Of course, uh, we're going to pull in another socket IO library. Ah, oh, damn it. I didn't, uh, update the title. Thanks for pointing that out. But, uh, yeah, I already missed it now. I guess I can. I thought I did update that. But apparently I didn't. So we're going to pull in another new library. We're going to pull in the Socket.io client library for Scala or Java. It is written in Java. It is a Java library. Um, it is a Java library. But since Java and Scala both compile down to Java bytecode, we can use this Java library in our Scala code. So we're running it using it in Scala, but it is a Java library for what it's worth. Uh, a lot of the structures the same. These are written by the same developers as a socket IO library, a client library. So a lot of the stuff is similar method names, similar structure and everything. So but let's see how it interacts with our Scala code on a Scala front end. Oh, my mouse is on the wrong one. So I'm just going to blast you with the code. Let's just jump into it. We've seen this structure several times already. So let's look at the new syntax which is very similar to the web side. So we're going to import all the relevant code from the library. We're going to make our connection a little bit different syntax, a uh, little bit different syntax. We're going to take IO from the library dot socket and then specify the URL for the connection localhost 8080 still, uh, still in our case and store a reference to that uh, to that socket, to that connection. And then we can use that reference just like we did in the JavaScript front end to, uh, to communicate with the server. So we're, we'll also call socket.connect similar to our socket server. We had to start the server, just creating this object, this reference isn't enough to make the connection. We have to explicitly say connect, uh, connect to that server. Yeah, nine viewers. There's, I think there's more than nine viewers in chat right now. Um, that's uh, like active in chat. The uh, uh, the syntax for receiving and sending messages very similar to 
uh, to the JavaScript, except we don't have a really easy way to do the callback like we do in JavaScript. So we do have to pull in a little bit of OOP here, which uh, looking at it, we don't strictly have to. Something we're going to talk about in a few slides. Um, but uh, but we do have a little bit extra work. But on the surface, the syntax is the same. We have the on method, which is going to take a string, which is the message type. So what type of message are we listening for? This is the same that we've seen several times already now. Listen for messages of this type. When you receive a message of this type from the server, this is how we're going to handle that. But now we're extending a different class and we have a bit different uh, different structure to the uh, to the listener that we have here. So here we're extending this emitter dot listener, which we're going to start seeing some things that make it clear that this is a Java library and not a Scala library, which we haven't quite seen before. This emitter dot listener, we need to override its call method, which is going to be called by the socket when we receive a message of this type from uh, from the server. And that call method takes an array, takes an array, sort of, of objects, uh, some data structure of objects, I'll say, some data structure of objects that uh, that is of type object. This is how we're going to get our information. So we need to do something to handle this information. Uh, object is Java's root class. It's like the any ref type in Scala. So it's just like any ref, similar to any ref. Um, and uh, any ref does compile to ob uh, object at some level. There is uh, they are to some degree the same. Um, and if we're expecting some information from this, so if it's a message that we're treating like a case object, then there's no information. We don't have to worry about these objects at all. If it this is a message that we expect to have data attached to, then we're going to pull the first value out of this these objects and call its two string method. We always have two string available to us. We're going to call two string, and since we're only communicating via strings for our um, for our, over our web sockets, we can always just call two string on this to be able to get the message. Then at that point, we can work with this message. Uh, make work with this message however we like whatever we need to do with this message if it's json start parsing json if it's just a, a raw string do whatever we need with that string but at that point we can do any of our scala stuff to be able to handle this uh this string so we have a little bit of overhead here we have to extend emitter.listener we have to implement call that takes a, an array ish of objects we have to access an element from that just the first one. And we have to make sure that it, we do have information here. We have to, if we're doing apply of zero, we have to make sure that we do expect, or objects.head we could do. We have to make sure that we are expecting some information attached to this message. If this is just ACK with no data attached to it, sent from the server, this apply of zero is going to give us an index out of bounds error. So we do have to be careful with how we set up. Or if you want to go the extra step, actually check. Make sure objects is not empty before accessing its information. Um, uh, but at the very least, make sure you're consistent throughout your app. If anybody's sending a message of type ACK, make sure it always has data attached to it if you're accessing that data. Yeah, the y'all don't have to talk about the viewer count. It's obviously broken. It's down to two. It's there there are more than two people talking in chat we know that's broken um which the the internet's i don't know it's kind of weird today the piazza was broken this morning too i think there's there's stuff going on to say the least uh which, which isn't too surprising I'm, I'm surprising i'm actually surprised there hasn't been more craziness going on on the internet with the internet being everybody's means of communicating right now there's uh you know there's uh a lot of malicious people out there who would like to just burn things down I'm surprised there haven't been more successful breaking of things 
let's say. Uh, I'm glad there hasn't been more, but uh, but even GitHub, GitHub was down when I was trying to update um, update slides for lecture. Actually, I think I was posting homeworks. GitHub was down for a bit. There were there have been some major uh, major downtime. There downtime in major sites uh, fairly recently. All right. Uh, so then to send messages, send messages is made way simpler than receiving messages. We use emit. The emit method again, so it's on an emit just like the web server or the website, the web client. Emit type of message, and if there's information attached to it, that information, so either one or two strings, and send it over the internet. I don't have much to say about the emit method because I've already uh, already talked about it. Yeah, PS4 down to it's. Hacker at UB. Well, I, I, like world, what this is a worldwide level. I'm sure they're not just attacking my stream. That'd be kind of a waste of their time. Uh, and uh, unless it's someone from the class, I don't know. But uh, I, I, if there's even something going on, it's probably nothing. But uh, one more thing: when we start talking about GUIs, this will be more relevant. But if you're running a GUI and you want a web, uh, a web client, a WebSocket client that is also interacting with a GUI. The problem uh, we have a slight problem here is that the GUI is running on a separate thread than your main app. So your WebSocket client is going to run on a different thread than the GUI, unless you explicitly tell it to run on the same thread, uh, because the the GUIs are inherently multi-threaded. The GUI has to listen for user actions while also running your code. Uh, you have to have some level of multi-threading there, or uh, or at least some level of concurrency, I sh should say. And the ScalaFX library that we'll see over the next two weeks does uh, does in fact use multi-threading. So to do that, we have to if we want to access the GUI elements. So if we get a message from the server and want to use that message to update something on the GUI, which is usually what we want to do, we want to update some information. Because if we're not displaying that information to the user, what are we even doing at that point? Um, we don't care if our software knows information. We care that our users know information. So we're going to use this platform that run later. This platform is part of Scala. Run later is going to take a function and call that function at some point in time, typically immediately or as soon as is convenient for the processor. But run it on the same thread as the GUI. This is going to go to that GUI thread, and uh, and run this code there. At the next time that that it's convenient, that it's available for that. And we're going to run this function, and I'm just going to take some information and slap it on a text box on a label here. Uh, and here we can see an example of receiving a message that's similar to our case objects server stopped we don't expect any information to be attached to this so this objects we just don't touch it we don't interact with it at all we just go to our gui and uh and access that information and here's something i i wasn't you know i didn't uh, uh i wasn't sure if i wanted to to show this or not but for this one i think it's it helps clean this up a little bit is if we extend a class where we're only overriding one method, we only have one method to override, Scala lets us shortcut this syntax by quite a bit. So run later actually takes an object of some type that extends runnable, the runnable interface in Java, which has one method to override named run that takes no parameters and returns unit. So that's what we have to do. So we could say, uh, class, some class name extends runnable and then override def run with empty parameter list and returns unit and then implement that using this uh, this code here, right? This code inside that run method. We're doing the same thing with what's inside this green box. We're doing the same thing, but we're shortcutting it using this syntax that Scala allows. So if you want to use this syntax, feel free. Uh, I'll just flash it once here and then not uh, not talk about it too much, uh, potentially. Um, but it is a nice shortcut. 
I like expanding it in lecture to show, to make sure you see that there is inheritance going on, that we are using OOP ideas here. We are extending things. Uh, using this syntax, it looks like this is a purely functional programming thing where I'm just take, calling run later and giving it a function. But this is actually OOP, not uh, not really FP. It's kind of, I don't know, the lines kind of get blurred, at least, uh, at least for me. Um, but this is... A, an FP syntax of an OOP, um, OOP functionality for what it's worth. So we could do the same thing with server stopped. W right here, we could say, um, we could just implement the call method, give this a function that takes uh, a, a list of objects and returns unit and implement that right in line. Uh, we could be doing that. We could do that for our server, our listeners on the server side as well. We can do use this syntax. Uh, so if you prefer that syntax, go for it. And let's take a look at some code. So let's. Uh, so let's take a look at, at some code. This is code we've seen over the past uh, past couple of lectures. But let's put it all together and see how our our stuff is working. So we have our web server listening for connections on localhost 8080. It's listening for chat messages of type string and a stop message message of type stop server with no information attached to it. Uh, we're also listening for connections and disconnects, but we're not really doing anything with those. Uh, this was stuff I was playing with during uh, Q and A last time. Uh, but these two, we're extending data listener of either string or nothing. Message listener is printing that message to the screen, and also sending a message back to the client, sending that ACK message saying, "Hey, got your message." When we stop this server, we're going to send a message to all clients. We're going to do this. Uh, some I have didn't mention in the slides, and we don't um, don't need it for clicker. You don't need it for your assignments. Uh, at least, uh, yeah, you won't need it for your assignments. Uh, but we're going to take our server, get its broadcast operations and send an event through that. What this does is sends this message to all connected WebSockets. And we're gonna tell everybody, hey, send everybody the server stopped message. So everybody connected to this server knows that this server is shutting down and then shut down the server. On the, let's run this server. On the website, we just saw this code today we're going to listen for those ACK and server stop messages and just display some information to the user based on the message type that we received. And whenever somebody inputs information in that chat box and hits enter, or hits the button rather, uh, we're going to send that in a message of type chat message to the server. The server's gonna listen for that chat message, call its message listener, and send back, hey, got your message. So let's see that. So here's our that's the best way to do this. Let me let me pull IntelliJ over there. Let's do it like this. So when I go to this box. We can see some communication. And let's if we refresh the page here, we can see all of the HTTP requests. We requested the uh, the file, the HTML file, the library, which we can see what the library is. It's a bunch of JavaScript. That we downloaded from that uh, from that URL. I want to preview uh, the JavaScript that we wrote, 
and the WebSocket itself. And if we go into the WebSocket, we can actually see all of the messages that are sent back and forth from the client and server. So if I submit some message, I can see that message of type uh, message of type chat message being sent to the server with the value some message, and the server is sending back a message of type ac. We're receiving a message of type ac with this uh, this information attached to it, and that information is being set displayed on the screen as well. So we can see all our communication going the way we expect it. And we can see our print messages from the server as well. You can see my refresh where I disconnected and reconnected. That was me hitting refresh in the browser, and we can watch all that interaction go on between the client and the server. We have a few other uh, examples. We there's this very uh, a simple example this is the first one that we saw in the slides for a, a Scala client. We're going to pull in that IO library, connect. When we receive an ACK message, we're going to process that message, which is just printing it to the screen. And we're going to emit one message of type chat message, say hello, and then close the socket right away. So if we run this, If we run this, well, <laughs> uh, you can't see the connection, but uh, I feel like I messed this one up. This is going to close the socket and end the program. I don't know why I have this close here. I thought that when I looked at it, but then I'm like, why would I have broken code in my repo? That doesn't make sense. Closing the socket, we're going to send this message and then close the socket. Um, the socket's closed before we get the ACK back, or uh, in our case, before that hello even reached the server. Anyway, I don't know why I set it up like that. But anyway, uh, we send the chat message. We can see that that message arrived at the server. And we get our ACK back. We're printing it to the screen that we're getting that I received your message of type hello. And one more. Let's get this in uh, during the lecture video. Uh, one more example where we're connecting this to a GUI. We haven't talked about GUI stuff yet, but uh, but we, we will uh, at some point over the next two weeks, depending on where I fit in the Git stuff. Uh, this has a few buttons on it. One button that's going to send a chat message and read the value that I have typed in a chat box. Another button which is going to send the stop server message to the server. And another button, this is what I built before but I forgot to mention it so it kind of lost its uh, usefulness. But a button, actually no because uh, uh, a lot of you haven't finished the lecture question yet. But uh, um, the uh, button that's going to send a message of type increment to the server which is made for you to be able to test that lecture question from Monday. So let's run this GUI. We can stop this simple client. So we get this little GUI. Oh no. Here we go. So we get this little GUI. The increment doesn't do anything because I am, don't have the lecture question running. But if you run this GUI and you want to test your lecture question from Monday, Hit this increment button that's going to send those increment messages to the web server so you can test that functionality. For our purposes here, let's go check out the server. Looks like that's saying, because I shut down the simple client, it was looks like it was mad about that. Um, but if I submit a message, I can see that the response from the uh, from the server, I can see the server getting the connection, getting that message of hi from that connection. Oh, that's a different connection. Disconnected, yeah. Disconnected, so D7. We can see this connection. This is our GUI. And we can see that message that we received from the GUI. And finally, if we click stop server, 
we get stop server on the web client. Lost my GUI there. No. I click stop server. I get the message server has stopped. We uh, we have uh, the stop ser stopping server message print line displayed on our server. We got a response that the server has stopped in our GUI. We got the response that server has stopped in our web app because this was broadcasted to all connected users. And we can see that message, that uh, server stopped message in our web, uh, in our browser that uh, we did in fact get that message from the um, from the server. And our library is diligently trying to reconnect to the server, but since the server shut down, there's nothing to connect to. So it's not gonna get that connection. It's just gonna be trying forever and never get that connection until we actually restart the thing.